We are here today on the um, 40th anniversary of the enactment of the Agricultural Labor Relations Law. And I first want to thank all of you for coming and all of the speakers uh, who have come today. 40 years is sort of half of a human lifetime, but remember 1975 was 40 years after the enactment of the National Labor Relations Act. And so what we are doing today is talking in four panels about the impacts and current status of some issues in the Agricultural Labor Relations Act. You know, some of you were here last year in this same room, and we talked about changes in the agriculture, changes in the farm workforce, and the water story, uh, the drought. This year, we're going to spend the first session talking about changes in agriculture and in farm workers over the last 40 years. And then we're going to have three sessions on the agricultural, uh, late various aspects of the Agricultural Labor Relations Act. So I want to start by thanking our sponsors. The four sponsors are listed on the screen. And I want to thank the speakers and thank all of you for being here. We've tried to design the program so that there will be time for questions uh, in each of the sessions. So please do have questions. This room has a lot of people, but it also is a room in which you're not too far from uh, uh, the speakers. Just two or three housekeeping details. There's coffee and snacks outside. We will have a break. There are bathrooms in various parts of the building, but I know there are some if you go to the right uh, back there. Uh, if you have any questions, Stephanie at the back or one of the other people will be happy uh, to help you. With that, let me say just two words on changes and then I will turn to Bill Gold. Uh, the, the main message that I get from going back and rereading much of what was written right after the passage of the Agricultural Labor Relations Act is it's really hard to predict the future. We say in economics, it's easy to become famous without ever being right if you're trying to predict the direction of the stock market or things like that. And that same would probably apply to many of the predictions made about what would happen under the Agricultural Labor Relations Act. Just one example, Varden Fuller, who was the really the great farm labor economist between the 1940s and the 1970s, the executive director of the President's Council of President's Commission on Migratory Labor in 1951, the professor whose entire PhD thesis is contained in the La Follette hearings of 19, what, the 40s, he predicted there would be contracts covering 7,000 farms and half of the farm workforce within two decades of the ALRA being enacted. He was wrong. That was, and he said that's a conservative assumption because he was writing against people who predicted 90% of farm workers would be covered by contracts back in 1976 and 1977. So we don't know the future. We do know what's happened in the last 40 years and we were try to shed or put some structure on things that have happened in the last 40 years in the farm labor market and in the ALRA. So with that, I should say I am Phil Martin, who a professor here <laughs> in Ag and Resource Economics, and now I want to introduce Bill Gold, who's chairman of the board and head of the ALRB agency. Thanks, Bill? Thanks, thanks very much. Thanks, Bill. Thanks. 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 Thanks, Phil, and it's really been, I uh, really want to thank you for, uh, uh, for your valuable contribution in putting this uh, conference together. It's been a pleasure to work with you and uh, uh, to, uh, uh, no matter whether you're here in California or in Burma or some other place, to jointly uh, uh, get this uh, conference on the, on the track. I want to thank, uh, I want to, you know, welcome all of you on behalf of the 
uh, board. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your interest in coming. I want to uh, uh, thank uh, in particular those uh, representatives of our agency, the Agricultural Labor Relations Board, who have come here from the central headquarters in Sacramento and in the regional offices, uh, and to uh, uh, thank them again for their commitment uh, to uh, the public interest as reflected in this 1975 statute, uh, which is designed to promote freedom of association and uh, the collective bargaining process amongst the amongst workers. Uh, in the uh, farms, and I don't know whether he's here or not, but he is going to be here, the Secretary of Labor, Governor Brown, Secretary of Labor, D David Lanier. I don't see him anywhere. David, are you here? No, I don't, guess not. But uh, he will be here, and uh, thank him for uh, uh, attending. Um, this is an exciting and uh, challenging uh, period that uh, we are in at the board, and uh, that uh, people who are involved in uh, the farms, uh, whatever their status, uh, are uh, uh, the face uh, now. As Phil has said, uh, a lot has uh, changed in this 40-year uh, period. Uh, uh, I came to this board after uh, being chairman of the National Labor Relations Board in the Clinton years. Uh, Governor Brown uh, uh, asked me to uh, uh, come back and to, uh, to this kind of uh, assignment and uh, uh, deal with uh, a framework that is uh, predicated upon, in substantial part, the National Labor Relations Act with certain uh, big uh, exceptions uh, uh, to the rule. This is uh, um, the National Labor Relations Act and the National Labor Relations Board uh, uh, are uh, the product of the Great Depression. Uh, they were designed to uh, produce a, a New Deal constitution uh, in the workplace to allow uh, workers and unions to uh, have the opportunity to shape their destiny along with the employers with whom they have a, uh, a relationship. And the uh, uh, act uh, established uh, this uh, independent uh, expert agency, the National Labor Relations Board, quasi-judicial, uh, designed to, to be expert and designed to enforce uh, our orders where uh, one party uh, uh, resists them. Now, uh, it's based upon the National Labor Relations Act. We're ce celebrating uh, the 80th anniversary of the National Labor Relations Act, uh, and I was just last week uh, at a conference with the uh, current members of the board and the chairman uh, uh, celebrating uh, and the board's general counsel celebrating uh, the uh, uh, 80th anniversary of, uh, of, that, uh, uh, of that statute. Really, this statute and the National Labor Relations Act, this Agricultural Labor Relations Act, in my judgment, have always had their basic origins uh, in uh, 1215. Magna Carta, Magna Carta, which is for which which we're celebrating the 800th anniversary of the, which established for the first time on an ever so limited a basis uh, the basic rights of individuals vis-a-vis -vis, uh, authority. Uh, Gomper, Samuel Gompers, the head of the American Federation of Labor, uh, talked about the concept of Magna Carta in connection with. Uh, labor legislation, uh, and uh, uh, this is what was reflected in the uh, National Labor Relations Act and the Agricultural Labor Relations Act. Now, the National Labor Relations Act, as we all know, uh, contains many imperfections. One of its imperfections is particularly relevant to our discussion today, and that is its exclusion of farm labor from its coverage. There are a number, many exclusions in the National Labor Relations Act, but one of the most prominent of them is agricultural uh, labor. And uh, that is why, and of course that was because the Congress uh, uh, was able to really ignore uh, those who were at that time politically impotent in our society, black labor, Mexican labor, Chinese labor, Filipino labor, uh, whose rights 
uh, were not uh, recognized uh, by the uh, statute. And so we had in the 1970s, as the result of the upheavals which followed the Civil Rights Revolution, uh, this new statute, the Agricultural Labor Relations Act of 1975, promoted, signed into law by Governor Brown, who called it at its, at its time uh, his greatest accomplishment in his uh, first term uh, in, uh, uh, in office. Much has changed over this 40-year uh, 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 period. Uh, and uh, uh, much has, uh, as Phil Martin has indicated, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the script has uh, evolved in a way that no one could have, uh, could have foreseen. Phil Martin has written 10 years after the enactment of the 1975 statute about the fact that the board held 900 elections in the first decade of its existence. 900 elections. I became chairman of this agency 13 months ago. And in that period of time, under a statute through which the sole basis of organizing is filing representation petitions with the board, not one single representation petition has been filed uh, with our agency. Now, when I spoke last fall at the Harvard Law School about this and indicated that at that time, no representation petitions had come forth, uh, uh, one of the people in the audience said, oh, perhaps that's because the employees are, the agricultural laborers are satisfied with their conditions, that they've improved so appreciably. And uh, of course, we see every day that uh, the unfair labor practice charges that are filed with us, which, for the, which in every instance, in most instances, do not involve unions, but involve workers gathering together to engage in concerted activity to protest what they deem to be unfair conditions. We see that that is not the case. We see that when I went to the Coachella Valley uh, just uh, last year, we see farm workers who are not simply living in their cars, but are living four to a car where uh, maps are spread out next to uh, the cars in which they live. The most wretched conditions a uh, half a century after Edward R. Murrow first called attention uh, to uh, nationally to this issue in his uh, documentary, Harvest of Shame. So I, I welcome you here today. We, we, we look to an examination of these past four decades as a lesson knowing in all humility how difficult, as Phil Martin has said, to uh, predict the future, but hoping, as Santayana said, to learn from the past uh, so that we can help shape a better future. Thank you very much.